All right, friends, I'm going to go ahead and give you a 30 second warning here. Um, if you have not grabbed the handouts, we've got one stapled scripture packet and then one super fun handout with graphics and stuff that I made. I'm very proud of this. Yes, one single sheet and then one like stapled with a bunch of, yeah, perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth is waving it around. If, if we run out, I'll have um, my lovely assistant Jeannie sprint downstairs. Well, maybe she's already done that and run off some more. All right, I am gonna go ahead and uh, I'll, well, let me make this announcement first. I know I've been talking about our women's retreat, October 6th and 7th. I think I announced it last week. I, I've talked to several people and there's been sort of a movement to go ahead and say, October's too crazy. Can we please not do it this month? Uh, and I am more than fine. With it. Carolyn is nodding her head. Um, Carolyn has a new grandbaby. So she is just really like, let's do it later, guys. Um, but for real, I appreciate all of you that have helped me with that decision and providing that feedback it's a bummer to not do something in the fall but i don't know what's going on my fall is insane um and so i i am totally cool with that so y'all be thinking about um uh coming to join us in march is sort of what we're looking at early march kind of right in the middle of lent lord willing that will be well i mean listen we're always going to be busy but lord willing that'll be a little bit less busy so y'all just be thinking about that march not spring break march i promise um with that in mind i'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer and we can get started so let's pray heavenly father thank you so much for gathering us together today lord we love you so much and it's such a joy to be with other believers to open up your word together and to study it so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us. Lord, would your Holy Spirit speak through me and, and help us to see what you want us to see. Lord, illuminate these words, light them up, um, and make an impression on our hearts so that we know it's you who is speaking to us, Father. We love you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we are here um, to continue our study on the covenant. Um, there are three three biggie Old Testament covenants and a couple more scattered throughout. So the three big ones are the covenant that God makes with Abraham, which we talked about last week. Today, the covenant God makes with Moses. And next week, we'll look at the covenant God makes with David. So those are kind of your big three, you know, Bible trivia main character guys, right? Abraham, um, Moses, and David. And God also made a covenant with Adam in the beginning. Um, God told Adam, I want to have this relationship with you and with the whole earth. And so I am going to sustain creation and you are going to be my image in this earth. And then God made another covenant with Noah. That's when we see that word covenant actually used. He says, no, I'm gonna make a covenant with you that I will never again destroy the earth with flood, um, but I'm gonna preserve it and I'm going to rescue you. And with Noah's covenant, Noah doesn't really have to do anything. He just has received this gift of grace freely. So then we get to Abraham a couple of generations later, maybe more than a couple. Uh, we get to Noah, I mean, Abraham. And God, what we see is God has picked, I mean, truly a random guy. A, he's not random to us, right? Because we know him as Father Abraham. But at the time he picks this random guy, Abraham, who was a pagan worshiper, in uh, Mesopotamia, the ancient Near Eastern culture. Um, and God says, for no reason, you've done nothing to earn this, but I'm gonna pick you to be a great, the father of a great nation. And it's gonna be through you and through your family that I will redeem the whole world. And so that's what we see a covenant is. I don't have the definition this week. Um, I will repeat it, but I don't have it written down on our sheet. But a covenant is a binding agreement that governs a relationship that already exists. So it's not just like a contract. It's something that governs a relationship. We see it the most clearly in our society today as marriage. Um, marriage is a covenant. That's what we say, especially if you go to a Christian wedding, you'll hear that language. So with Abraham, God enters into a covenant with Abraham. He has this existing relationship. God's the one that initiates this relationship. And he says, follow me and I will give you three things. So if you've got your worksheet, these are the three 
covenant promises that God gives to Abraham. Does anyone remember from last week? Land, yeah, we can say land, and the order doesn't really matter, but land, children, offspring, yes, land, offspring, and the last one's kind of tricky, but he promises to bless Abraham, blessing, just like general blessing, but we're going to dive a little deeper into what that blessing means today. So I know I said there are three covenants, um, three big ones but they're not three new ones. Each covenant is what God uses to go deeper into relationship. So with Noah, we really see this covenant between God and one man um, and kind of the whole earth too through Noah. But with Abraham, we see God is picking one specific family to make his covenant with. And so today what we'll see is that he's, he's picking a nation, more than a family, it's a full nation. And so that's what we're going to look at. Um, so just to kind of fill out some of this genealogy so we can catch up. I mean, what we're doing, guys, this is pretty crazy. We're doing like full Old Testament overview in like five minutes. Um, well, really over the next four weeks, we're doing like the full Old Testament. So we have Adam and Eve, Noah and Abraham. That's who we've talked about so far. Abraham has a son named Isaac. So you can put Isaac in that next box. And then Isaac has two sons. Does anyone know their names off the top of their head? Jacob and Esau. And again, I think it's just helpful to get these, these stories. I mean, when you're a kid, I mean, I'm reading these Bible stories to my kid. And I think I read like the story of Moses and then the birth of Jesus, like right next to each other. It's like that, there's a lot that happens in between them, which is great. So it's just helpful to get up these stories in order. So we've got Abraham, Isaac, then you get Jacob and Esau. And then Jacob has 12 sons, and one of them is a guy named Joseph. Uh, I sent Casey Blighton this text earlier this week. Joseph's the story, well, Joseph's the story, um, you know, the 12 brothers are, or the 11 brothers are jealous of Joseph. And so, because their dad shows him favor, so they, what I texted Casey about was this funny picture. I should have posted it up here, but it was like, they didn't tell their dad that this favoritism was hurtful. They didn't maybe just take his coat. They beat him up and sold him into slavery. Like what a leap. Like that's quite the, the dramatic um, leap there. So they, they take their brother Joseph, they sell him into slavery. He ends up in Egypt, he's falsely imprisoned and then he miraculously is released from prison. Then not only is he released from prison, but he goes from falsely accused convict to second in command of Pharaoh in Egypt, which at the time Egypt was like the ultimate world power. So he is like the second most powerful man in the world. And throughout all of Jacob, uh, Joseph's story, the Bible tells us God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph, even when it did not feel like God was with Joseph. And it's important. Why am I going into all of this? It's important to understand that Moses' story really starts with Joseph because Joseph um, ends up saving his family from famine. He reconciles with his brothers. They all move into Egypt, and that's how Genesis ends. Genesis ends with Moses, uh, with, uh, with Joseph, chapter 50, dying and passing on the blessing to his son, the sons. And so um, Exodus begins. You turn the page, Exodus begins, and it talks about how uh, several hundred years, uh, yeah, I guess several hundred years later, um, the, a new Pharaoh had risen to power and had forgotten Joseph, had forgotten that this family, this people group, actually um, were supposed to be friends of the government. And there's a lot of historical reasons. If y'all are curious for more of a deep dive on this, come talk to me, I took a class uh, in seminary on this, and there's just like a lot of history that goes into this. It's very cool, um, but it's too much for our time today. Moses' story begins, Exodus begins by, um, if you've got your Bible, you can open to Exodus 1 and just see, but it starts off by showing the first of this promise, this covenant uh, promise coming to into being, offspring. They have grown from one family with the 12 sons into 12 tribes. I mean, hundreds of years have gone by and 
the, the reason the Egyptians were so scared of them is they were almost outnumbering the Egyptians. They were so great of a nation in size. And so what he does is he enslaves them and he um, takes away any of their rights and forces them to build um, probably some of the stuff that we could see today if we went to, to Egypt. And so um, that's where Moses' story starts. Uh, you, you may have heard, if you've been in church, you've heard the story of Moses was supposed to be killed because he's trying to um, he's trying to administer this horrible form of birth control, right, to keep the population down, where they kill all the babies. And yet Moses is saved. He's put in a basket into the Nile, and Pharaoh's own daughter rescues this Hebrew boy and raises him up. Well, time goes by. Moses sees a, a Hebrew being uh, bullied by an Egyptian. And he decides that he's going to be a Hebrew today, and he kills the Egyptian. And then he has to flee for his life because the Pharaoh is now going to kill him. So that's where we're going to pick up this morning. I hope, I mean, y'all, I just like blasted us through like rocket speed. But that's where we're going to pick up because, uh, and I hope this context helps. So we're going to read our first little passage, the covenant remembered. Um, and then we'll talk about it. So this is from Exodus chapter two. This is the very end after all the little Moses story that I've, the, the baby in the basket killing the Israelite, uh, the, the um, Egyptian, Moses flees. And this is where we pick up. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. I picked this translation. This is the English Standard Version. This is the ESV. I picked that because I love that line, God knew. Um, so we've got, let's start, let's back up a little bit. They cried out for help. I think this is really interesting because you do have to ask the question, who are they crying out to? Um, at this point, Genesis had not been written yet. Moses writes Genesis, probably in the, the desert period or after. Um, so they don't have Genesis. All they have to know about their fathers, the God of their fathers, you might hear that. I think we have a hymn called God of Our Fathers. The God of their fathers, it's all verbal stories passed down through generations. And so it's really a cool picture of faithfulness to see this people group is crying out to, to a God that they have never had a personal encounter with. They just have these stories. And that's that's exactly what we're doing, right? Um, we haven't been able to speak to the Lord the way that Abraham did. And yet we see that there is a group of people in slavery and their response is to cry out to the Lord. Well, we're assuming crying out to the Lord. It could also just be crying out um, in general. It is no one there, is anyone there to listen to our cries? And it's important to note, you know, we didn't look at the first two chapters of Exodus, but God has not been mentioned yet. It's just been kind of giving us like the historical background and talking about Moses. And God's been mentioned very passively, sort of referred to. But these are the first action words we see of God. So there's um, three action or four action words we see. What does God do? God hears, God heard, God remembered, God saw and God knew. When it says God remembers, and I think we talked about this a little bit with Jonah, I can't remember, but this idea of God remembering, one of my seminary professors said, no one has to set an alarm clock for him. It's not like, oh, I forgot, but I'm gonna remember and show up now. This word remembered is the same thing that we use to say, I'm gonna use this pen, I, have to rem I remember to take the top off before I use the pen. Just this very instinctual, God does not have to be woken from a slumber. He is not absent. Um, but it's this powerful image of God, God saying, I, I know, like this is instinctual to me. This covenant is instinctual to me. And he remembers this covenant all throughout this time of suffering. Even though it felt like he was silent, he never actually forgot them. And so it says that God heard their cries, he saw what they were going through, and he knew. And this word knew, it, it's this word that means he has taken everything into account. He sees the whole situation for what it is, even what human eyes could not see. And he knew the truth of the situation. 
And so I think that's a really powerful way for us to start this. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you'll hear that again a lot throughout the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is how people are going to claim this God, because at this point in the story, he has not introduced himself as Yahweh. Up until now, we just have God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So isn't that cool that the mighty God of the universe identifies himself first as a God of these three people who are not all that great. They all have some, some tough stuff in, in their history, but God identifies himself with these people. That is how he wants to be known. And so we come now to the covenant reintroduced. Um, before we read this, what you know, you know what happens. God leads them out of Egypt. There's the 10 plagues. It's ugly, it's nasty. They cross the Red Sea. They end up, um, they end up walking around for a while. They begin to doubt God. It's this back and forth, back and forth. And so we see in Exodus 19 that God is going to, through Moses, reestablish, reintroduce the covenant, remind Moses, my covenant was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it's still active for Abraham's offspring, which is you. And so that's where we're going to pick up chapter 19, verse 1. Um, I have just chosen six verses. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So you see they're in Sinai. Mount Sinai is still a place. You can go there. There is a monastery, um, or maybe it's an a order of nuns, um, in a building at the base of Mount Sinai. This is where they've ended up, outside of Egypt, the wilderness of Sinai. And it says that Israel makes its camp at the base of Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up to the mountain. So we already see this idea of God has, even within this nation, he has chosen one man to represent the whole nation. So Moses is a mediator between the people and between God. And so he tells Moses, this is what I want you to go back down the mountain and say to them. And I want you all to hear this covenant language, um, especially if you have been here the last few weeks, you might see some similarities in what we've already talked about. But the first thing we see is this reminder of the relationship, um, this description of what their relationship has looked like so far. So God says, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians, and I, I brought you out myself. And there is no mystery to anybody in the ancient Near East about who is the strong and powerful one. It's not the Egyptians. It's definitely not the group of slaves that don't have any money or like even homes to their name. It's their God. So God has brought them out. And so what he is saying now, now that the relationship's established, now that we've had this preamble, if you will, that's the language we've used the last two weeks, this preamble, now God's going to initiate the covenant or, or re, um, reintroduce the covenant is the word that I chose, reintroduce. So here's the if, right? You can circle, underline, box, whatever. Here's the if. And, and again, notice this comes after the relationship, right? They're already in relationship with God. And so now we get to the covenant promises, stipulations, responsibilities, blessings, all that stuff. So we've got the relationship. If you will obey my voice and keep the covenant, then here is what I promise you. So here's the responsibilities of the Israelites and the blessings that are promised respond to this relationship God is saying I have brought you out of Egypt and you did no covenant blessing I mean the only thing you did was be circumcised so good job for keeping that one up 
but that's it. God, God has brought them out of Egypt and now is giving the law. He did not wait for them to get the law figured out and then take them out of Egypt. Y'all have heard me say this until I'm blue in the face. This is the right order. Relationship first and then rules. And the rules are what we do to show God um, our, our response to his grace and his kindness and his mercy. I've said this before. Romans 2 says it's the kindness of the Lord that draws us to repentance. So if you want to respond to this relationship, then obey me. Be obedient. And if you are obedient, then here's what you're going to get. Three things. And this, this is, again, I want you all to see, um, we've already talked about the offspring. The offspring promise, I, we can't, you know, we're not going to check it off like God's fulfilled the promise, but it continues to grow even today. The offspring, right? We can see it's gone way beyond um, just this little family of Abraham and his people, right? So the offspring is kind of, we've already talked about that. What we're going to see now, this is the blessing section. God's re So none of this is new. That's just what I want you all to see. I'm going to talk about these three things, but none of this is new. All of this is under the heading of blessing. Moses, uh, God to Moses is fleshing out. This is what that blessing is going to look like. This is what it's going to mean that you'll be blessed and you'll bless others. So that's, that's my little note on that. So the first thing God says, you will be my treasured possession among all peoples. I think it's really remarkable. God could have chosen any people group. He could have chosen the Egyptians to be God's special chosen people. He could have gone straight to Pharaoh and chosen Pharaoh to be the big strong leader. He could have uh, waited a couple of years and chosen the Assyrians or the Babylonians. He could have waited longer until the Roman Empire was at the height of its strength and he could have entered into that time in history. But for some reason, this is when God chooses to come in and say, I claim you as a nation. These, uh, the Israelites are the treasured possession. And again, I've been saying this the whole time. You are never chosen. It's, it's never chosen um, just because. God picks one for the sake of the many. God pulls one out, one nation out for the sake of all the nations. You will be my treasured possession among all people, choosing one for the blessing of all. And here's how you're going to be a blessing. First, you'll be a kingdom of priests. Second, you'll be a holy nation. Kingdom of priests. A priest's role in any religion is to mediate between the people and God. So we've already seen how Moses is sort of serving as this priestly role. Moses is mediating between the people and God. Um, but that's what he, what do you, a kingdom of priests, what does that mean? It means this whole, everyone, this, this whole nation state of Israel is supposed to fulfill that priestly role. That as a nation, people should be praying for the surrounding nations. They should be hoping that they thrive and flourish. They should be encouraging them to turn to the one true God. This is the role that, uh, that God wants Israel to play in history. Sometimes they do that and sometimes they don't. Uh, I don't have a map today, but if you think about where Israel is on the map, it's in between Egypt and it's in between Assyria, Babylon. It's right smack dab in the middle of all these crazy world powers. And there's a reason for that. God wants people to have to go through what should be a holy nation, a nation set apart so that they would be a witness to the world. Their very physical space is, is a gift from God to be able to fulfill these blessings and promises. And so kingdom of priests, they're supposed to represent God to the people um, as they're a holy nation. And they're also supposed to represent the people to God and pray for them, intercess for them. And holy nation being, again, different for the sake of everyone else to see who is this God that you serve. Well, we want to see that in, in the character of this nation. Um, at, you know, we are in a democracy. That's our type of government, which I think means like government of the mob, I think is what it literally translates to, which is a little concerning. Maybe, I'm not sure. Latin is not my thing. But, but um, uh, God is saying you are a theocracy. Your leader is me. 
I am the leader. And we'll see how Israel does not love that so much once they look around and say, well, hey, everybody else has got a king. Why don't we have a king? And we'll see a little bit more about that. But what God is saying is, I'm your leader. You don't need a king. You've got me. I'm your leader. You will be my priests. I'm the God. You're the priest. This is a theocracy. And so this is what it means for Israel to be a nation of blessing. I mean, again, if you hear nothing else, I'll say it. They are set apart for the benefit of everybody. This is, this is God's universal desire is that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Yahweh is the one true God. And Yahweh has chosen this people group to help others along the way. You know, we talk about, we're Presbyterian, so you've heard that term election before and, you know, makes your eye twitch a little bit because you're like, that doesn't seem fair. Election, divine, you know, election, the idea that God has chosen each one of us in this room to be his servant, to be his adopted daughter. It's because he wants us to then go out and um, bless the rest of the world. We are chosen to be a blessing to others. We are chosen to welcome others in, to raise our children into the faith. Um, to witness to our non-believing um, brothers and sisters and neighbors. That is what we're called to do because we are now a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. And so what follows right after chapter 19 is chapter 20. And um, chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. And again, it's important to see when in the story does God give the Ten Commandments? after he's reestablished the covenant, after he's reintroduced it and said, hey, you're in a covenant with me, remember that. So we get the Ten Commandments, again, not as like a kind of random list of rules to follow, but as a way to show our obedience and our dedication to the Lord, as a way to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Think about how much of the Ten, I'm not gonna look at the Ten Commandments if you've got your Bibles open up to them, sure. Um, Think about how many of the Ten Commandments have to do with right worship. You'll sh you shall have no other gods before me. You won't make an image of me because you're my image. Um, you will not take my name in vain because you are my priests. This is what it looks like to be a priestly order. And think about what it means to be a holy nation. Treat your neighbors this way. Don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery. Be a nation of priests, be a holy nation. And again, it all comes after the relationship. So a lot happens in Exodus after that. We get a lot of law. There's lots of chapters on, on law. Um, and there's lots of descriptions of the tabernacle. And I wish I could talk more about the tabernacle, but we're not going to have time. But the tabernacle is the place that God is going to dwell among the people while they're in the wilderness. And so it's, it's, it is filled, Exodus is filled with detail about what God wants that tabernacle to be. Again, is he a control freak that's a little picky about his interior design? No. All of this is to show his holiness. And in fact, and this is why the tabernacle is so cool, it's a recreation of Eden. Every detail is a callback to Genesis 1 and 2. All of the jewels that are used, all the colors are, that are used are, are described for us in Genesis of what that garden would have looked like. So what we see is God is trying to make his, um, his, his presence dwell again in an Eden. He is fighting to bring his people back into Eden. And so that's why um, we are skipping from 19 to 34, because in the middle of that is talking about the tabernacle. And so we come now to um, Exodus 34. And I mean, this, I just want you all to say, I know I've said this a lot, I have been struggling with this one because I could have included so many different passages. And so if I encourage all, if any of this is just kind of giving you like a little appetizer, go through and, and read what happens in Exodus and, and see how much more richness I've had to cut out from this discussion. But Exodus 34 starts with Moses um, interceding for the people after the golden calf incident. Remember that? The golden calf incident. And Yahweh introduces himself to Moses as the Lord is um, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, 
but will by no means clear the guilty. We talked about that again in the Jonah study. So I encourage y'all to go back and listen to that one. I think that was um, the final Jonah, so week five, to hear more about what, why God um, uses those words. But this is the first time we hear those words. The beginning of chapter 34. So now we're gonna read um, a couple of sections from 34 to see this is the moment where with, with Moses, God really renews the covenant. And God said, behold, I'm making a covenant before all your people, I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of, our, of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you. And guys, this is the land part. So you see we've gone from offspring, blessing, and now he's reemphasizing land. Before, behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care, and here's sort of that warning. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare, a trap in your midst. You shall tear down their altars, break their pillars, and cut down their asherim, which is like the giant um, poles, like of gods. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Okay, walking through this. Um, you know, I think the we kind of like, again, just this idea of God being a jealous God can make us kind of in our like, you know, you're reading this and you're like, gosh, he sounds kind of petty, right? Um, maybe not. That could be your first reaction. And I would say that this is the equivalent of, um, you know, maybe I, I don't want to be crass about this, but maybe you ask your husband that if you could have a relationship with another man and he responds with no. Like that's that's what's happening here. Like not cool with that. It's a covenant. And what we see is this relationship is so strong um it's it's like a marriage but it's not just like a marriage this relationship is so strong it's like a parent and a child but it's not like a parent and a child this relationship is so strong it's like a god and his people i mean we just don't have the words to describe the way that god feels about us and so we have to say it's sort of like a marriage or it's like a parent child relationship um, these are like the only things we can do to kind of understand the Lord's love for us. And so what he's saying is you are going into a place where they um, where they will sacrifice to other gods and you're going to be invited to sacrifice to these gods. You're going to be invited to to marry with with people that don't know me and don't worship me. And instead of you being a holy priest, a, a holy nation of priests set apart, you're going to get so mixed in you cannot tell where the culture stops and where the people begin you won't be able to tell because it's going to get so mixed together that it's confusing and we you know we see this happening all the time today right we don't know where the culture stops and where the church begins and that's because i think we we do exactly what the people here did we give a little oh, it wouldn't be that bad We'll just do a little bit of this, do a little bit of that. Um, and then the next thing you know, it's hard to separate. Well, is this a church or is this just another country club where you have a membership? I mean, we, we pick churches, like we pick country clubs in, in the South, especially, right? Like, how do we know, like, where does the culture, um, where does the culture stop taking over the church? Because what it meant for these people was they had to be separate. They had to be so separate that people looked at them really strangely. Um, 
when they said, no, we're not going to have temple prostitutes for Yahweh. They were like, gosh, y'all are a bunch of prudes. Like, really? You don't worship God with your body and you're not free like that? That sounds oppressive. So I just want you all to understand like what, what these people were going through is not, not too far off from what we are also going through. Um, and we can be encouraged because what God is calling us to is a level of obedience that sets us apart. And sometimes that will be extremely off-putting. But sometimes this is the way that we can be a blessing, that we can encourage human flourishing, that we can show what is God's design for humanity to grow and to be beautiful and to be life-giving. It's going back to understanding what is our relationship like with the Lord. He is a jealous God. He does not want us to assimilate to the culture in this way. He does not want us to get sucked in. He wants us to be set apart. And so this is the relationship um, that we see between the covenant, the, the again, I have a relationship, between the covenant and the law. The law is just a function of the covenant. The law is just what helps govern this relationship and it serves the covenant to kind of give it some, some definition. The law, you may have heard me or court say this, is a duty and a delight. Like this is how we show God that we are his people, is that we submit ourselves to his law even when the culture tells us um, that that's wrong. We're saying we serve our God, not the people. And so just to kind of keep cruising a little bit here, if you've got your sheet, I kind of highlighted some major events that happened in Exodus that we didn't really get to talk about, but the next few books are about of the Bible are about this. They Leviticus is a lot of detail about the law, but it's also about the covenant. Leviticus has both these um, ritualistic things that seem very foreign to us, um, you know, over 3000 years later, which is fine that it feels that way, but it doesn't mean we just totally write it off. The law is described in great detail in Leviticus, but so are the blessings and the consequences of following Yahweh. And you can find, I mean, if you look through Leviticus towards the end, I think it's chapter 26, you will see like the heading is like blessings, consequences, right there on the page. The numbers is when you have wilderness and wandering. That's what it's like because um, they were scared to go into the promised land. And so that book is all about well, what happens in those 40 years in the desert and why does that happen? You can read all about that in Numbers. And I don't have this on here, but Deuteronomy, and I, I didn't put it on here because Deuteronomy is crazy. Deuteronomy is, we talked about it last year. Um, I don't think I have recordings of those, but I could try and find it. Deuteronomy is actually written like a, a true ancient Near Eastern covenant. Like it reads like a contract. Um, it's called the Hittite Vassal Treaty is what we, we actually have that example from ancient Near Eastern cultures that were not affiliated with the Israelites or Yahweh at all, the Hittite Vassal Treaty. And Deuteronomy is laid out in the exact same way. There's the first few chapters are like the preamble of the relationship. The next few chapters are uh, general kind of stipulations for what it means to follow Yahweh. Then the next few chapters are specific. And then it ends with blessings and consequences. So I wanna end our time today by just kind of reading that. If y'all want to turn, if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Deuteronomy 28, because I want to show you something. Deuteronomy um, chapter 28 starts with the curses, and what's so interesting, or the starts with the blessings, and again, it's just God saying, if you follow me, this is what I will bless you with, and it's everything, it's land, offspring, blessing. So he says, if you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that, I command, that I'm commanding you today, then the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, but your city will be blessed. Your fields will be blessed. The fruit of your womb, the fruit of the ground, all of that will be blessed. Um, you're going to have good weather. Like that's the detail that God gives here. And then in verse 15 of chapter 28, it immediately starts, but if you do not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments, which I'm commanding you today, then these curses shall come upon you. 
and it's almost word for word a reversal of everything he's just promised so curse you'll be in the city cursed you'll be in the field curse will be the fruit of your womb the food of the ground you're gonna have really bad weather um and 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 i'm gonna send enemies i'm gonna take the land away so do you hear this the offspring's not gonna be a blessing anymore because uh, it's gonna be hard to have kids um the and, and the, the ground isn't gonna listen you're not going to be a blessing to the nations. You're going to be a curse to the nations. No one's going to want to have anything to do with you or they'll be enslaving you. And then you're also going to be ejected from the land. Can y'all, all this comes to pass. I mean, Carolyn Ashworth's been doing a Sunday school in first Kings, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. And it's all accounting like how bad things get. And at the end, it ends with, they get kicked out of the land. And it's very sad and depressing, but there's also a little bit of hope. And that's what sets this apart from normal treaties. And this is where we get, you all remember last week, Abraham, um, when God made a covenant, covenant, God himself walks through these animal carcasses that are broken and with blood everywhere. And God says, let this be done to me if you disobey the covenant. And so what happens here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, it says, when all of these things happen to you, because they will, the blessings and the curses, if you call them to mind, among the nations where the Lord has driven you. So once you've lost the land, if you return to the Lord your God and you and your children obey him with all your heart, with all your soul, then the Lord will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you. He will gather you again from all the peoples among whom your Lord God has scattered you. If you are exiled from there, you will be gathered back. The Lord will bring you back into the land that your ancestors possessed and he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your ancestors. So this is what's the promise. This is the hope is, is we all know as we're reading about the story, because in the middle of all this, the golden calf incident happens. So like, we know this is not gonna go well. And what God is saying is, I also know this is not gonna go well. And so I've made a way for you to have true repentance. And that will be what brings you back into the land. And I ended this, with this last week, but I'm gonna end with it again too. These promises are still true for us in the name of Jesus Christ. We are told that we will have um, multiple uh, blessings. I, I just described it, when we are a kingdom of priests, first Peter talks about this. He says that we are a nation of priests and he's thinking about this. He's saying in Christ, that's now what our calling is as Christians, to be a blessing in the world. And then he also says, um, um, Jesus tells us that uh, to go and make disciples of every nation. So our offspring will not just be limited to one people group, but our offspring, or to one family, to one people group, but our offspring is anyone who comes to faith in Christ as we, can, as we are a witness in this world. So as we go out and evangelize, as we go out and share the light of Christ with the world and people are then attracted to God, that is how um, we have offspring. It's spiritual offspring, spiritual children, spiritual grandchildren. And then the final thing is this idea of the promised land. So God tells us that one day we will return to the land that is ours. There will be a new Jerusalem, a new heavens and a new earth, a new garden. And at the center of this new garden is a tree of life and, and is Jesus himself. And so this is the promise that we hold on to, that we know we are not just a, a chosen people. Um, we, uh, we, we are a chosen people, but we're not, just, um, we're not just trying to recreate, you know, what we, what we see happening in this Old Testament but the Lord is actually helping restore to us and to the whole world what we lost in Eden, what we lost with Adam and Eve, and that God won't stop until this happens. So with that, all that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and close us in prayer, and then we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. So let's pray. God, we thank you for creating a way for your covenant to be renewed. Um, Lord, we want to turn back to you with true hearts uh, of repentance, God. We want to know um, how we can respond to your love with obedience. And Lord, only you can teach us that. So we pray that even now you would reach into our hearts, that we would respond um, in obedience 
um, to what you're calling us to do, Lord. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, my one discussion question, which we've got like a couple minutes, so y'all might need to scoot out. But it is, um, well, I lost it. Well, how does the law of God make you feel? Um, it could be positive, it could be negative. But how does thinking about the law in the light of the covenant maybe change that view or encourage it? So that's the discussion question. Again, it's almost one o'clock, so y'all feel free to go if you need to. But talk at your tables. Thank <laughs> you.